The color pie is not set in stone. Throughout the years of magic design, the five different colors have drifted between different core capabilities. In the early days, black had artifact removal and blue got direct damage. Over time, these inconsistencies were smoothed away, with each color gaining its own distinct mechanical identity. But even in something as foundational to the game as the color pie, things change. Hello and welcome to another episode of Gemstone Mine. I'm John, and today it's time to go back to that article from last fall, Mark Rosewater's Mechanical Color Pie Update for 2021. The color pie is a term used by Wizards of the Coast to describe the way they divide up the unique effects which cards can have in a game of magic between each of the five colors. The decisions are meant to be both flavorful and mechanically relevant. As we discussed in our last episode on this topic, white has been gaining some interesting ground in the name of mechanical rebalancing, gaining access to more card draw and effects to gain card advantage, which it had previously been absent within its share of the color pie. While a color like red is generally going to be very good at answering smaller creatures efficiently, as a lot of its answers tend to be based on damage. Mechanically, the goal behind the color pie is to make sure that no one color can do everything well which some players may question, giving some recent design choices in standard for colors like green and blue. But ideally, it's supposed to make sure that each color has its own distinct personality, and that this reflects in the relevant options players have access to during both gameplay and deck building. We are going to focus on a color which historically has been seen in vastly different lights from casual to optimized corners of the Commander format. And we're going to look at what sorts of changes may be in store for this color in light of the Mechanical Color Pie article from last year. To help better understand the strengths that a color can bring to our deck when we're building it, as well as weaknesses that we will need to account for. Without further ado, let's talk about black. And actually, I think that it's important in this case to dip our toes into the philosophy of the colors as characters in order to grasp what black really is. Black is best understood through the flavor text of Dark Confidant, greatness at any cost, usually by requiring some kind of resource expenditure of a source other than mana, paying life for additional cards, such as on Dark Confidant itself, or sacrificing creatures, such as on Village Rights. Black is also fundamentally selfish. Black tends to reward players who lean heavily into the color in very direct ways, usually by counting the number of swamps you control, or in giving you more black mana. If you play a lot of swamps, you can benefit from Cabal Coffers. Black has lots of effects like this. So keep these traits in mind as we begin to unfold what black is capable of. And just like last time, we're going to start by assessing black's weaknesses as a color before we dive into its strengths and then Rosewater's article. Black has historically been the color most closely tied to death, having spells that send a creature directly to the graveyard regardless of its size. Dice to Doomblade is the name of a whole trope of arguments in Magic for a reason. And as a result of this, Black has historically had difficulty interacting with things that aren't alive. Originally, this was a top-down approach to flavor cards. Terror, one of the original removal spells for creatures, can only destroy non-Black, non-artifact creatures. And scaring an artifact creature like a golem or construct to death didn't really make sense from a top-down perspective. But later designers latched onto the non-artifact clause to lean into mastery over death as the reason why Black would not be able to interact with artifacts and enchantments. Black's greed also requires a lot of devotion. Black spells often require a lot of pips of black mana in order to cast them, usually more so than you would see in other colors. Sometimes, this provided a powerful effect at a lower total mana value, with the sneaky cost being that you had to sacrifice access to those other colors in order to have enough black mana to cast the card on curve. If you give in to the temptation, black rewards you with some potent effects. Cards like Necropotence, which can be difficult to cast easily with black, black, black in its mana cost. Finally, black more than any of the other colors is often dependent on setup costs in order to succeed. We'll discuss this more in a few minutes, but keep it in mind. A lot of the discounts when the cheating of mana that black offers you usually come with some invisible setup costs, Costs which don't become apparent until you actually play the color in-game. Now let's start by looking at black's strengths. First, black more than any other color really benefits from Commander being a format that starts at 40 life. Life is such a common cost for black to pay as part of its effects, 
and it is almost always costed for 60 and 4 formats, where players start at 20 life. Starting at 40 life means that cards like Sign in Blood are 2 mana draw 2s with virtually no other drawback, Necropotence is a 3 mana reload your hand every turn when you play it conservatively, and Ad Nauseam is a strategy defining staple in CDH, which effectively reads, you win the game with some extra steps. Black has also historically been the color with the most tutors and the most unconditional tutors, with the ability to get any kind of card from their library, which offers a significant amount of redundancy to black decks looking for a particular card or effect in order to execute on their game plan. Demonic Tutor, Vampiric Tutor, and Imperial Seal are basically the go-to unconditional tutors in CEDH. The most limited tutors that Black will often use would be cards that specifically tutor creatures into the graveyard, cards like Buried Alive. Next among their strengths, Black has always been good at answering creatures, and in recent years has begun to share the mantle of having the best sweepers with the color of white. Toxic Deluge is one of the best sweepers in the game, at 3 mana being able to answer every single creature on the board, even indestructible ones, and then you get to be the first person who starts rebuilding. This is a very powerful effect. Black's next strength is more of a historical effect at this point, that being Potent Rituals, which are one-shot bursts of mana which play well into storm effects or in launching you ahead of opponents, in terms of tempo by playing a single powerful card ahead of curve. We've instead seen black in recent years lean more into the greed part of their color pie, rewarding players for heavily investing in black as a color. Everyone knows Cabal Coffers, a land which, for two and a tap, will give you an amount of black mana equal to the number of swamps you control. But we also have cards like Nirkana Revenant and Cryptgast, creatures which give you an additional black mana whenever a swamp is tapped for mana, if you're heavily invested in black as the primary color of your deck, these mana doublers get a lot better. But that is in addition to rituals like Bubbling Muck, which is a temporary mana doubler for swamps, and Reign of Filth, a mana doubler for all of your lands at the cost of needing to sacrifice those lands in order to get a second black mana out of any of them. I'm also going to group together the concepts of cheating costs and graveyard manipulation. The reason is these really do go hand in hand. I had a discussion with a newer player this week who was looking for a way to close out the game with their black inclusive deck, and we talked about reanimation as one of black's strengths. The idea of bringing back the dead to serve as a win condition is very flavorful for black, and it also dovetails nicely into black's strengths at cheating of costs. Basically, black often gets an upfront mana discount on an effect if it's willing to pay another cost, like paying life, sacrificing permanence, etc. And reanimation effects, from the classics like Animate Dead to Reanimate to the more modern templating of Zombify, can give you a significant discount on getting a very big, very powerful creature into play without needing to pay its upfront mana cost. The reanimation strategy is so fundamental to what Black does that it was frequently used to name a whole archetype, such as Legacy Reanimator. And it is here where we start to see the invisible setup costs that Black needs to achieve in order to take advantage of the other powerful, cheap cards which Black gives you access to. Without Sacrifice Fodder, Black can't draw cards off of Village Rights. Without a way to get our fatties into the graveyard, we can't cheat on cost by reanimating them. And without lots of swamps in play, Archibald Coffers actually sets us back on mana. Now let's move on to the article from 2021. The big gain that Black can point to from the Mechanical Color Pie article is that it now is secondary in enchantment destruction. Quoting Mark Rosewater, We've also started to let Black have enchantment removal. It's clearly at a power level lower than white or green, and often forces the opponent to sacrifice the enchantment, or makes you pay an extra cost. And thus far, we have had a small number of spells, usually printed at common, which give Black an edict effect for enchantments. We have Baleful Beholder, Debt to the Kami, Extract Truth, Feed the Swarm, Invoke Despair, and Firika's Libation. Edict effects usually get a bad rap in Commander, as there are many board states where an opponent will have less valuable creatures available who they can afford to throw away to protect their more important creatures. But the board tends to have far fewer enchantments on it than creatures, with fewer fodder enchantments that players can afford to just throw away which I think overall is a net gain that the edicts for enchantments have over edicts for creatures. 
Personally, I still think I'm overall happier with Feed the Swarm over the other Edict effects, but I'll have to think on it more and start to track how often an Edict would have done the same job in my own notes. Also, just note that the modal effects of these various spells offer a nice backup mode to prevent the Edicts from being totally dead draws. A big codification in this article, which didn't get as much attention though, is the Gonti effect, or playing cards off of the top of an opponent's library. Now, this is a tricky mechanic to consider. On one hand, it is very easy to balance within a playgroup. If you're playing your opponent's cards against them, it's really hard to be more fair than that. On the other hand, gontying opponent's cards is difficult to do on webcam, though quick shout out to infinite tokens and other similar dry erase tokens for a good way to make a quick substitute for a card you've taken from a player half the world away. And stealing someone's cards tends to be a quick way to draw heat in pods with less experienced players. Let's actually dive into this because it's kind of a good mini lesson. One of the level up moments for players is when they realize that milling a card doesn't affect the board. You're not down a card. Gonting a card is similar to milling a card. The top card off of an opponent's library is likely to be worse than a random card out of your own library, since you're more likely to hit a card that has more synergy with your game plan off of your own library. Trying to stop someone from gontying because they might hit that card you need is generally a worse strategy than trying to stop someone from gontying because it represents a card advantage engine. The odds that an opponent will gonti away with the one specific card you're looking for are very low, and if they do hit it, it's not all that much different than a game where you simply don't draw it. Imagine a card being milled or gontied as being on the bottom of your deck. You're not drawing that card during a normal game anyway. So whether they're sitting at the bottom of your library or under Gonti's thumb is effectively the same for you. Along the same lines as Gonti, Black is going to be seeing more cards that can cast cards out of graveyards, both their own and of their opponents. We've already seen the power of cards like Underworld Breach, and the power of Yawgmoth's Will is a well-documented one in the annals of CDH history. Black is going to be primary going forward in casting spells from anyone's graveyard. And note that this does not just mean literally casting a card from a graveyard, but also casting cards that were supposed to be in the graveyard. This has been seen on cards like Dalthy Voidwalker, who gontees cards that are being discarded or going to the graveyard after resolving, so that way they can be exiled for later use. So we might be looking at fewer actual Yawgmoth's wills and more gonting of cards which were already on their way to the graveyard for use later. In one of the hot topics of 2022, Black is going to be secondary in treasure production, another source of potential ramp for Black, which really does seem to harken back to the heyday of Black rituals. I don't think that this represents a major change for Black as a color, but it does open up the door for more of Black leaning in as the color of kind of turbo ramp, even without red as part of its strategy. Black is also now secondary in Flash, allowing its creatures to act as pseudo-kill spells in the form of surprise blockers. The primary advantage here is that Black is very good at getting creatures back out of the graveyard, making their quote-unquote kill spells reusable over the long game. That said, you're generally only going to get them once, and once you've spoiled the surprise, you're unlikely to get very much benefit out of the Flash that the creature has, unless it already does other things for your game plan as well. Now, we may continue to see a trickle of creatures with the new kind of gotcha mechanic, such as on Opposition Agent, who have either a strong ETB effect or a static ability, which punishes players for a spell or ability they already have on the stack. And this is design which we really probably should be watching out for under the heading of Flash. Ward, one of the new keywords from 2021, is going to appear on black cards, often with a cost not in mana, but in life, which players will need to pay. In its early incarnations, I don't see this as being a major benefit in Commander, where, as I already noted, players tend to have so much life to play with. I could see it being more powerful in the form of a mass protection spell, which black could potentially get, such as an enchantment which gives all of your creatures ward pay one life. This, however, isn't something I expect to see a lot of, as that's really more white and green share of the color pie than blacks, but it is potentially something that R&D may explore while they're looking at mechanics like Ward. 
The article also outlines other costs that Black is likely to pay for the resources at once, specifying things like discarding cards, paying life, sacrificing creatures, as well as mentioning artifacts, and finally just the general heading of other permanents. There's not a lot of news here, though discarding cards as a cost is actually somewhat nice to see codified, as it can potentially make Black a lot more independent of colors like blue and red, that it has traditionally depended on for both looting and rummaging effects to draw and then to discard the big creatures that they were hoping to reanimate later. And that is an overview of Black's share of the color pie in 2022. Obviously, I couldn't cover everything, and I didn't even really have time to look into the various color pie bends and breaks that have occurred over the years. I also left out some of the tribes which have their foundation in black, like zombies and vampires, and I didn't really get a chance to talk about some of the powerhouse combo engines in the color like Yawgmoth. So there's still a lot left to talk about. What do you think about Black's place in the color pie? What do you like or dislike about the direction that we've seen Black take in recent sets? You can let us know in the comments on YouTube, where we are Gemstone Mind Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe if you enjoy the episodes that we're putting out. You can also add us on Twitter, where we are at GemstoneMindMTG, or you can send us an email gemstonemindpodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, I'm John, and this is Gemstone Mind.